On January 30th, 1649, King Charles I of England and of Scotland was publicly beheaded, having been found guilty of attempting to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people and of waging war against them. But where exactly in London did the king's head roll? Hello, my name is Mikoy Wisniewski. I teach British um, culture and history at uh, SWPS University in Warsaw, and I would like to share a little um, anecdote with those of you who are English history buffs. Uh, this summer I took my son on his first trip to London, and of course I wanted to show him all the famous landmarks of the city, St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Abbey, the Tower, and of course Napoleon's Nose. Now if you don't know uh, where it is, next time you're in London, try looking for it. I also wanted to show him the place where King Charles I was executed. It seems, however, that there is no statue or even a tablet commemorating the execution of Charles, one of the turning points in English history, like Battle of Hastings, the signing of the Magna Carta, Henry VIII's break with Rome, and of course, England beating Germany 4-1 in 1966 in the World Cup final. There is an equestrian statue of Charles I at Charing Cross, but that one is from 1633, when the king was still alive and only beginning to annoy Parliament with his high-handed ways. But why is there no visible memorial of the king's execution? A huge moment not only in English, but in European history, when a monarch was for the first time officially put on trial by his people and reminded, very sharply if I may say so, that he does not stand above the law. Is it because the English are a little ashamed of having beheaded their own king? After all, they love the royal family and their new king is also a Charles. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about what the Civil War was about. Uh, first of all, as we say in Poland, if you don't know what it is about, it is most likely about money. Or to be precise, who has the power to collect money, that is, introduce new taxes and customs duties on exports and imports? A little aside here, the king's father, James I, the first English monarch of the House of Stuart, left his son a piece of advice in the form of a political treatise called Basilicon Doron, which means the royal gift. And in it, apart from reminding his son that good monarchs should not drink and sleep excessively and be acquainted with mathematics for military purposes, he basically argued for the divine right of kings to rule. That is, that a monarch is not accountable to any earthly authority, is not subject to the will of the people. Well, in England, this was sure recipe for disaster. Charles believed that he didn't really have to summon and consult Parliament, and that if he did so, it was only as a matter of courtesy, only because he was such a nice guy. Well, Parliament in England had quite a different opinion on this. Two, the English Civil War was also about class. The king was supported by the old landed aristocracy, Parliament by the increasingly influential mercantile class, merchants, who hated the fact that the king could, from day to day, introduce new taxes on exports, imports. How can you do business in such conditions, right? 3. It was also about religion. The Stuarts were always pro-Catholic. Charles couldn't restore Roman Catholicism in England, but at least he could make the Anglican Church, which he was the head of, seem Roman Catholic. He appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury this man, William Laud, who rejected the Calvinist notion of predestination, asserted the importance of free will for salvation, and made sure that churches in England looked Roman Catholic, that is, were sumptuously decorated and full of colorful art. He also persecuted Puritans who challenged all this. They were arrested for seditious libel, their cheeks were branded with hot iron with the letters S.L., and their tongues were pulled out. One such Puritan was William Prynne, and by the way, this name, Prynne, should sound familiar to students of American literature. 
but that's another story. The Puritans hated all that, as you may imagine. They found it very suspicious that Charles's wife was a French Roman Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria, the sister of the French king, here on a portrait by Anton van Dyck, the most famous of Charles's court painters. But Puritans were increasingly becoming financially and politically influential. At first, they wanted to put the ocean between themselves and the Church of England run by Laud. They went to America. But when they heard that a war against the king finally started in 1642, many of them returned from America to join the fight. One such person was George Downing, after whom the street in London is named where the Prime Minister lives. But that's another story. First and foremost, however, the English Civil War was about fashion. The supporters of the king were young, dashing aristocrats with long, curly hair, dressed in rich silk and velvet with lots of lace and pearls, leather boots and hats with ostrich plumes. Check out this dude's shoes. I love them. The most flamboyant of them was the king's cousin, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, who, it is said, rode out to battle with his favorite black poodle in the saddle with him, whom the superstitious Puritans found terrifying. The Puritan army preferred a much simpler style, black coats, black hats, and hair cropped short, which is why they were called roundheads. The battles of the Civil War were battles of fashion. After a long and bloody war, the bloodiest war in English history, Parliament finally found an able general to lead the fight, Oliver Cromwell. They put the king on trial and, to his great surprise, sentenced him to death. Charles was executed in front of the banqueting hall on Whitehall, roughly halfway between Westminster and Trafalgar Square. The house was designed by Inigo Jones, Britain's first classical architect who brought exciting new designs to England from Italy. For example, he designed the Queen's house in Greenwich for Anne of Denmark, the wife of King James I. The house is said to be haunted by a very creepy ghost called the Tulip Staircase Ghost, and it was first captured on camera in 1966. Jones also designed St. Paul's Church, not St. Paul's Cathedral, whose front, in Covent Garden Square, is really its back. And its back, hidden between rows of houses, is the main entrance. But that's another story. On the left side of the banqueting house, there is a gate and an iron railing. And behind it, a small yard and a door, above which there is a bust and a plaque. It says, His Majesty Charles I passed through this hall and out of a window, nearly over this tablet to the scaffold in Whitehall where he was beheaded on January 30th, 1649. It seems surprising that the king passed out of a window to his execution, but that is because a high scaffold was constructed in front of the banqueting house so that the crowd outside could witness the beheading from afar. The king's head, therefore, rolled high above the street, some 12 to 15 feet above your own head, and a little to the right if you're standing in front of the door on the corner of the banqueting house. The window through which the king passed was later bricked up, perhaps on the orders of his son, Charles II, who, after he gained the throne in 1660, was bent on erasing all memory of this shameful deed. However, if you look carefully, you will see the silhouette of the window that isn't there, the window through which, one might say, King Charles left this world. And one more thing, if you turn around and look up, you will see the clock on the tower of the Horse Guards building, and on it, a big black dot marking the time when the king's head fell. 2 p.m.